This morning's reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 17, to chapter 5, verse 14. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbour, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper! Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mally, for that reading, for that long reading. Uh, if you have a Bible, keep it open to that, that passage, and uh, in the next hour, hour and a half tops, I'll go through all that. 
It feels like we need at least that to do it justice, but uh, let's pray. I'd like to use this prayer from a song called Speak, O Lord. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ may be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Amen. Well, as Richard says, we've been in a sermon series in Ephesians for a few weeks now, and uh, it was about a month ago, well, it was exactly a month ago, because I know it was a, a, a deaf joint service, that uh, I spoke about transformation and how Paul uses a before and after sort of picture uh, for how we were before we found Christ and how we should look after when we we're in Christ. And I told you about uh, our hearing dog, Gabby, who the first time I took her for a haircut came out looking like an entirely different dog. And then I've got an update now. Our new dog, Jason, had a haircut last week. And uh, so, got the next slide. There he is, before and after. So th the point was that uh, as Christians, we should look different. But not only look different, it's because something has actually happened on the inside that has changed us, that has transformed us, and should transform our behavior. Paul's letter sent from the prison in Rome to the church that he formed in Ephesus was a concise summary of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and its implications for daily living for those who had accepted Jesus. Transformation is not only external, what people say, it's the internal, receiving Christ's salvation. Something happens on the inside that ought to be reflected on the outside. In chapter 1, Paul summarizes this where he says, you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked past tense, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. This is who Paul is addressing when he writes to the Ephesians, these people who have accepted Christ, who have started this new life in Christ, those who have heard the message believed it, and received the Holy Spirit. And the key concept from our passage this morning that I'd like us to take away is this putting off of the old and putting on the new. Putting off the old self, the old ways, the old life, and taking up the new life that has been given to us in Christ. Living through the Holy Spirit who we have received. Paul begins in verses 17 to 19, again with this contrast picture, the before and after. He highlights the futility of the old life, of those outside Christ, represented by the Gentiles. He says quite categorically, I insist on it. You must no longer live like that. It's futile. They're separated from God because of it. It's ignorance. And because of it, they've given over themselves to all kinds of immorality, sensuality, and greed. But, he says, referring to this thing that has happened if you accepted Christ, that's not the way of life you learned. You were taught to put off your old self, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. The phrase in verse 20, to know Christ, literally means to learn Christ. It's a personal experiential knowledge that includes teaching about Christ, but also receiving him, receiving his person, his work, our identity in him, 
and now how we are to live as a result. But in the middle of this putting off the old and putting on the new, Paul says we are to be made new in the attitude of our minds. Verse 23. John Stott in his commentary says this, this verb is a present indicative, infinitive. It indicates that in addition to this decision to reject the old and assume the new, implicit in conversion, a daily, indeed a continuous, inward renewal of our outlook is involved in being a Christian. An inward renewal of our outlook Paul says elsewhere in Romans 12, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. It's an attitude thing. It's how we think of ourselves on a daily basis that changes our behavior. He says to the Corinthians, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Is good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you've ever wondered what God's will for your life is, this is how to know it. Dave Smith, in his book, Transform Living, tells the story of a man who was a poacher, who was one day caught and sent to prison. In prison, he turns his life around and decides to put his knowledge of wildlife to better use by training to become a gamekeeper himself. On his release, the head gamekeeper takes pity on him and gives him a job on the estate that he used to poach. He no longer wears his poacher's coat, but instead wears a brand new gamekeeper's coat. Very grateful for this opportunity, he goes about his job with great diligence. One day, whilst getting ready in his hut, he decides to try on his old coat again just to see how it feels. He stands before the mirror and lots of the old feelings come back. Deep down, he knows his new position is better. Yet, standing in the old coat, he remembers the excitement of sneaking around, of lying when asked what he was doing and stealing from the estate. Then with a start, he turns around and notices the head gamekeeper is watching him. He looks embarrassed and ashamed. But the head gamekeeper does not shout at him, but rather kindly says to him, put on your new coat. The head gamekeeper is not just calling for a wardrobe change. He's saying, drop all allegiances to the old ways of living, sneaking around, lying about what you're up to, breaking the law, stealing. You have a new position, a new identity now. It's been given to you. It's yours. You have it. Be grateful and live up to it. This is what Paul is sim- similar to what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 4. You've been made new, clothed in righteousness. Why would you go back to filthy rags? I love that song that we sing, King of Kings Majesty. You know the one? There's King of Kings Majesty. And on the, in, the, uh, in the chorus it says... God of heaven living in me. I'm, I can't remember where it goes now. (laughs) Your majesty, I can but bow. I lay my all before you now. In royal robes I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. We're to see ourselves clothed in those royal robes, to put off the filthy rags and put on this new life. There's a, a sitcom that I used to watch on Channel 4 called Spaced in, back in the 90s. And uh, there's, a, there's a great line in it where um, there's this one character called Brian, who's a bit of an eccentric, he's an artist, and he's just met this, this girl he's going on his first date with. And he's a bit nervous, so he gets dressed up, and he comes into the room of uh, Tim, this other character, and he says, what do you think? Do you think I should lose the jumper? He's wearing this baggy, horrible, old, ill-fitting jumper. And Tim says to him, no, I don't think you should lose the jumper. I think you should burn the jumper. 
Because if you lose the jumper, you might find it again. That's what Paul's saying here. We need to do something drastic to the old life. We need to burn it. We need to give it up and put on this new way of life. As he says in Romans 6, we are to think differently. We are to count ourselves dead to sin. If we want to alter our behavior, we have to have this radical change of mind. Tom Wright says, there is a persistent untruth which has made its way into the popular imagination in our day, that Christianity means closing off your mind, ceasing all theory, serious thought, and living in a shallow fantasy world, divorced from the solid truths of real life. But the truth is that genuine Christianity opens the mind. As Paul has been saying throughout this letter, and, is, and, it, and in its companion piece to the Colossians, so that we can grasp truth at a deeper and deeper level. Paul says in Colossians 3, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And he goes on to say, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which has been renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. We've taken off the old self. Let's not be tempted to put back on those filthy rags. And let's be renewed in knowledge in the image of our creator. It's not a new command Paul is giving. It's one that he says to the people, you have received, so now live in it. Old self, new self. Thomas Merton, the Cistercian monk, suggested the use of the term false self for this old self. He did this to clarify the meaning of Jesus' words that we are to lose our lives, that we must die to ourselves to find oneself. Your false self, Merton said, is how you define yourself outside of love, relationship, or divine union. Another word for it is ego. After you have spent many years building this separate egoic self with all its labels and habits, you become very attached to it. But he says the full self is an illusion. It doesn't exist. It exists nowhere else but in your mind. And that's why it's so fragile. It's inherently insecure because it doesn't exist except in the world of perception. We know it, don't we? Whenever we are offended, for example, it's because our self-image has not been worshipped or momentarily exposed. We become angry because our desires have not been met. This full self, our old nature, is, is what must die. Our thinking must change. We must live from the new self, the Christ in us and us in him. So in the remaining verses of our reading, which you'll be grateful to know we're not going to look at in detail, Paul gives six concrete examples of the nitty-gritty of our Christian behavior. Telling the truth, controlling our anger, honesty, kindness of speech, forgiveness, love, and sexual self-control. All very practical, and all have three things in common. First, they concern relationships with other people. We can't practice our holiness in just a mystical relation to God. It doesn't exist in isolation from other people. You can't be good in a vacuum, but only in the real world of people. Secondly, in each example, a negative prohibition is balanced by a corresponding positive command. It's not enough to put off the old rags. We have to put on the new garments. So it's not enough to give up lying and stealing and losing our temper unless we start speaking the truth, working hard, and being kind to people. And thirdly, in each case, 
a good theological reason is either implied or given. So therefore, don't tell lies, but rather tell the truth. Don't lose your temper, but rather ensure your anger is righteous. Don't steal, but rather work and give. Don't use your mouth for evil, but rather for good. Don't be unkind or bitter, but rather kind and loving. Don't joke about sex, but rather be thankful for it. It's not enough just to give something up. We have to take something up to replace it. Again, quoting John Stott, the theme that has run right through chapter 4 and spilled over into chapter 5 is the integration of Christian experience, what we are, Christian theology, what we believe, and Christian ethics, how we behave. They emphasize that being, thought, and action belong together. For what we are governs how we think, and how we think determines how we act. We are God's new society, a people who have put off the old life and put on the new. That is what he has made us. So we need to recall this by the daily renewing of our minds, remembering how we learn Christ as the truth is in Jesus and thinking Christianly about ourselves and our new status. Then we must actively cultivate a Christian life. For holiness is not a condition into which we drift. We are not passive spectators. On the contrary, we are purposefully to put away from us all conduct that is incompatible with our new life in Christ and put on a lifestyle compatible with it. There's a story of a young police officer who was taking his final exam at Hendon Police College. The first three questions in this exam were relatively easy. And then he got to question four, which went like this. <clears throat> You're on patrol in outer London when an explosion occurs in a gas main in a nearby street. On investigation, you find that a large hole has been blown in the footpath and that there is an overturned van lying nearby. Inside the van, there's a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. You recognize the woman as the wife of your divisional inspector who's away on a course. A passing motorist stops to offer you assistance, but you realize that here's a man who's wanted for armed robbery. Suddenly, another man runs out of a nearby house shouting that his wife is expecting a baby, and the shock of the explosion has made the birth imminent. Another man is crying for help, having been blown into an adjacent canal by the explosion, and he cannot swim. Bearing in mind the provisions of the Mental Health Act, describe in a few words what actions you would take. The police officer thought for a moment, picked up his pen, and wrote, I would take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd. <laughs> Dave Smith comments, we cannot be tempted to think like that, to take off our Christian clothing and mingle with the crowd, to be like everybody else, because it's so much easier. We're called to be distinctive, to retain our Christian identity wherever we are, whatever the circumstance. At the end of our reading, Paul emphasizes this in the strongest possible way by introducing a new image of the transformed life. He says, you were once darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. Notice he doesn't just say that Christians are those who used to live in darkness and are now living in light, although that would be true. Rather, he is saying, you were darkness. Now you are light in the world. It is we who have changed, so much so that we are now to be the light of Christ that we take into the world to represent him. I began praying from that song, Speak, O Lord, 
It says that the light of Christ may be seen in us today. As we go from here, let's pray that that light is seen in us. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that you would take your truth and plant it deep in us. Shape and fashion us in your likeness. That the light of Christ might be seen in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Amen.